give you a minute to join and adjust your volumes as, as necessary. I hope you can all hear me and see my screen. Um, so thank you for, uh, for joining us for our, our fifth uh, town hall. Um, really excited to host this one on the criteria or the case-based assessment. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before, um, before I pass it over to our presenters today. Um, if you could, of course, typical Zoom etiquette, please keep your mics off unless you're speaking. You can uh, always use the Q&A feature that is integrated into Zoom if you have any questions as we go through the presentation. We will save the questions uh, for the end of the session, but can certainly appreciate that you might want to add them as they occur to you. Uh, we did um, review the questions that were submitted through the survey ahead of time. So we've done our best to incorporate all of those uh, questions and answers into the presentation that we will provide you with today. Um, also wanted to note that the presentation is being recorded today. So that will be posted for those who weren't able to be here. You can watch it at your convenience. Also to note that the other uh, previous town halls are also on our YouTube channel if, if you missed out on, on those. Um, additionally, the slides will also be uh, posted to our website uh, if you wanna grab any of the links that we have in, in the slides. And at this point, I will pass it over to Ken Lomp to provide a land acknowledgement and some opening remarks. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. Uh, while we meet on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this nation home. Um, my name is uh, Gunnar or uh, Ken Lomp, and uh, I'm the uh, current president of uh, the College of Registered Psychotherapists. I'm pleased to welcome you to this, as Amy pointed out, the fifth of nine town halls that we will be hosting in this uh, fiscal year. Today's session is focused on the Quality Assurance Program and reflects the work of the Quality Assurance staff and committee. If you attended the previous town halls, you will recall that I have a long history with the college dating back to the development of the entry to practice competencies. I have also been involved with the uh, QA committee for quite some time, which I currently chair. In reflecting on those early days of the committee, I can say with confidence that the quality assurance program and the work of the college's QA staff and QA committee have evolved tremendously since the days of the Transitional Council. Arguably, its work has evolved the most in comparison to the other college's statutory committees. An important ingredient of that evolution, many of you may likely have heard us talking about, is the use of the right touch risk-based approach to regulating at CRPO. For those of you who haven't, or as a reminder to those who have, this model advocates that regulators use as little force as possible in implementing their mandate of public protection. The key elements of the right touch approach are to identify the problem before the solution, quantify and qualify the risks, get as close to the problem as possible, focus on the outcome, use regulation only when necessary, keep it simple, check for unintended consequences, review and respond to change. Ultimately, it is a framework in which professionalism can flourish. It is not prescriptive and it takes an iterative, iterative uh, approach to improvement that allows the college to ensure that we are taking sustainable approach through the correct use of resources, creating professional supports versus burdens, sharing and building on reassuring results, encouraging registrants to engage with the regulator and with their own professional identity and development. You will be hearing today about how the Quality Assurance Program, and in particular the case-based assessment, is built on this model. 
We are pleased to be providing this update today. In that regard, the QA staff team is here to present. I'll ask everyone to introduce themselves as they speak. As I mentioned, today's town hall will cover the quality assurance program, but will focus primarily on the case-based assessment. In covering this topic, we will aim to answer all the questions that were posed in the Survey Monkey before, before today's session. Thank you to everyone who contributed to that. It really assists us in making sure that we are providing the updates you want to hear. And finally, before we start today's session, I just want to note that we have five more town halls planned. Okay. Are you here? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, please check out the topics. We will be setting dates for 2025 sessions in the next few weeks and look out for email reminders and opportunities to pose more questions. I'll now pass it over to uh, Deb to uh, continue the agenda. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Deb Adams. I'm the registrar at the college. Uh, like Ken, I want to thank you for being here. It's a great opportunity for us to engage. Um, I always say this, I'll say it again. I wish it was in person, but uh, we'll manage with Zoom for the moment. So um, on to the next slide. I wanted to start by talking about, um, actually, it's a, a, another slide. It's the, the OREG slide, please. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to start by noting where the authority for the Quality Assurance Program lives. Uh, it's important to take note of the fact that this is something that's required of all registered health professionals. Um, you're all expected to participate in the QA program as required by the RHPA. With the introduction of the College Performance Measurement Framework, the Ministry of Health actually established some further standards for health colleges related to how we ensure the QA programs are current, they're relevant, and they're effective. So this includes looking at the assessment of registrant competency, professionalism, ethical practice, and quality of care. CRPO's Quality Assurance Program is designed to encourage RPs to think critically about their practice, their professional growth, their obligations as regulated health professionals, and ultimately to support lifelong learning, which we believe is a critical component of effective care. Moving on to the underlying philosophy, got my, my mouth wrapped around that. Um, and just to build on Ken's introduction around the right touch risk-based approach here. The program is really about building a proactive supportive model that puts the college resources firmly on the side of the ledger that's intended to prevent standards breaches, right? So mitigating risk, of harm to clients, which by extension mitigates risks of complaints and reports that registrants face. I want to look in the next slide at the three elements of the quality assurance requirements. There are three pillars to the program. These are the professional development peer and practice review or PPR and professional improvement pillars. They come from the regulation again, and they're common across health colleges. All three, all colleges have these three pillars. They look different potentially, but they exist. The goals are pretty straightforward. Support registrants' ongoing self-reflection and professional growth. To engage regularly in a conscious reflection of practice and participate regularly in growth opportunities based on that reflection. Uncover areas of practice that may benefit from development, professional development, continuing education, thought, reflection. Tackle and reflect on, on professional growth. So at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Madeline so that she can talk about this professional development activity part of the process. So hello everyone. My name is Madeline Lee. I'm Senior Coordinator for Quality Assurance here at CRPO. So under the Quality Assurance Program regulation, every registrant must participate in self-assessment and professional development activities every two years. In addition, CRPO must monitor registrants' participation in the QA program. We can move on. Moving on, so the process starts with the completion of a self-assessment. So new registrants are expected to demonstrate that they are engaged in the QA program by completing a self-assessment within the first 60 days of registration. After this, registrants are expected to complete at least one self-assessment every two years. And in addition, for every two-year cycle, registrants must complete at least 40 hours of professional development activities to maintain the knowledge, skill, and judgment required to practice the profession. Ideally, registrants should refer to their self-assessment while planning these professional development activities. In the past, we have seen a disconnect between how registrants self-assess their knowledge and understanding of the professional practice standards and what they choose to undertake as PD. 
We appreciate the efforts registrants employ in maintaining clinical and modality specific currency, but have had some concerns around the lack of engagement with regulatory specific PD. And later on in this presentation, Deb and Monica will be discussing how your CBA outcomes can also be used to direct your professional development activities. So moving on. So the reporting cycle for odd year registrants, so those registered in 2015, 17, 19, and 21, ended on December 31st, 2023. You'll hear about the CBA, its five-year cycle, and how it ties to the timing of other QA program activities later on in this presentation. At this point, I just want to reiterate that the PD reporting cycle does remain the same. The 2023 reporting results were reassuring, where 5,798 registrants were required to submit an attestation and self-assessment in their CRPO account by December 31st, 2023. On March 5th, 2024, 143 registrants had not completed their requirements and were at risk of receiving an administrative suspension. Of the non-responsive registrants, eight received an administrative suspension and four were being monitored further. To prevent non-compliance and administrative suspensions, staff make several attempts to contact and support registrants in completing their requirements. So prior to the deadline, we publish notices in our communique and we send targeted email notifications and reminders. So after the deadline, we attempt to reach non-responsive registrants by phone and mail in addition to emailing. So um, as we move on, I would like to also mention that the CRPO sees the practice advisory service as part of its proactive quality assurance program elements. So our practice advisory service is comprised of experienced RPs and staff. The service is meant to be an educational resource that provides support to registrants in using their professional judgment. So I should also note that this service does not replace the support your professional association can provide or provide specific legal advice. So as you can see from these statistics, the, the practice advisory service is a well-used service among our registrants and members of the public. The slide shows the number of queries we receive each quarter with a steady increase in queries throughout the years. We remove the themes within the queries we receive, and the most commonly asked queries are published in our communique and our website as practice matters articles for registrants to review. Now I'll pass this to Deb to talk about the other elements of our quality assurance program. Thank you, Madeline. So I wanna note that registrant numbers are now over 14,500, and they continue to grow on average by more than 100 new registrants a month. So we're getting to be a large college. In light of this, we knew when we reviewed the program that we needed a way to ensure that we have an effective and sustainable way to assess continuing competence related to the professional practice standards. So in the first iteration of our QA program, which was developed when the college was proclaimed, we randomly selected registrants to participate in peer and practice reviews. Random selection without any screening, it's not an effective way to find or engage with RPs who are at risk of not meeting the standards. So to ensure that we're using the right touch risk-based approach to quality assurance, we developed the case-based assessment or the CBA as the first stage of the peer and practice reviews. So why add another program element? Next slide, please. So the CBA is really the cornerstone of the college's quality assurance program now. It's evidence-based, it's a screening tool that identifies risks in practice and directs resources where they are most needed to help registrants provide safe and effective care. That's the college's kind of takeaway from the CBA. For registrants, the CBA is an opportunity to engage with the professional practice standards and a way to continue to think critically about your practice, to inform your professional development activities, as I mentioned in the previous slides, and your obligations of regulated health professionals. For some, it will be an opportunity for renewal with the standards in the profession, people who may not have looked at their, uh, their standards as part of their professional development in some time. As Maddie noted, we had seen a disconnect between the professional development activities that people chose um, and their self-assessment of their knowledge of the standards. And so for all, the college and, uh, and registrants together, it'll be opportunity to identify gaps that expose registrants to risk. So I wanna look on the next slide at the concept of risk and talk a little bit about how we're defining it and how we're using it. 
So the Quality Assurance Committee established a blueprint for the case-based assessment that we'll talk about. It shows how the cases are distributed. They did this by using a risk register that measures both risk frequency and risk severity. So frequency, pretty obvious. It's based on how often the issue arises with the college committees in the practice advisory inquiries and, and system uh, partner input. Specifically and, and importantly, we look at complaints and reports and discipline to see where registrants are struggling. Risk severity is determined by reviewing the significance of outcome um, related to those issues. So is it a situation where a breach of the standard um, often results in, in some kind of uh, mitigating proactive response, like a specific continuing education and uh, remediation program for registrants? Is it the kind of risk that gets people referred to discipline? Uh, is it something that we're hearing about overwhelmingly in the practice advisory? These are the things that we looked at. The college is actually now conducting in-depth and regular review of complaints, reports, and that discipline data. We're really coding every element of it to determine which elements of practice are the most likely to create issues for registrants. So in other words, where are the standard breaches that could cause client harm uh, the most likely to happen and where will they cause damage? So knowing this allows us to create an assessment that will give registrants information about their own risk exposure so they can address any gaps that, that might create problems for them relative to the standards. So in the next standards, uh, the next slide, I just wanna look at, at, at the standards and make a, a quick connection for you. Hopefully you already know this. Um, professional practice standards are the minimum base requirements for all RPs. That's what you agree to meet when you sign up and take on the protected title. They are ultimately the framework that supports competent and ethical practice. They contribute to the profession earning and maintaining the public trust. We want to be able to say to the, to the public that, you know, psychotherapists adhere to these standards. We know that this is the kind of care you're going to get with a psychotherapist. And they're responsive to evolving practice environments. So as you may have heard or read, a new version of the practice standards was published and is in effect starting from January 1st of this year. And one of the questions that we get about the case-based assessment is how they will work with the new standards. So just some reassurance to start off. Um, the standards revision was not a complete about face. We did not throw out uh, any of the standards. They were updated to better align with frontline practice, the things that you are seeing in your practice now, um, and, uh, and to be more reflective um, of the reality of psychotherapy and the needs of the public and the expectations of the public. So the current CBA cases still reflect this. They still reflect standards that you are working with. We are intending to introduce a couple of new standards uh, related to anti-racism and cultural competence. Those will be coming up in the, in the next few months, and we will phase them into the CBA in a way that allows registrants time and support before they're expected to apply these new standards. So moving on to the next slide, I actually wanna show you a little bit of the blueprint so you can understand how the CBA is tied to the standards. So essentially the, the, the math is that the number of cases for each section of the standards, the six, six major standards, corresponds to the level of risk identified by that risk register that I talked about. So this blueprint outlines the professional practice standards that are being assessed in the 2024 CBA, so the current CBA. Registrants completing the assessment are presented with proportionally more cases corresponding to those so-called high-risk practice standards than the ones that we see as being low risk where there are few inquiries, few complaints, et cetera. And the number of cases for each section of the standards corresponds to that level of risk. Moving on, I just wanna talk a little bit about the case-based assessment before I hand it off and Monica actually gets into some details on that. Um, so on the CBA itself, just really briefly, and we will provide more information, as I said, further down. It consists of 30 situational judgment cases. Our Quality Assurance Committee, as, uh, as Ken suggested, helmed by Ken uh, and working with our QA consultant, has worked with over 50 active practice registered psychotherapists to develop the cases. The goal here was to bring in as much diversity of perspective, both lived experience, uh, practice modality, community of practice, as possible. Each case outlines a situation and provides five response options. Registrants are asked to rank those options from most aligned with the standard to the least aligned with the standard. This type of ranking is called situational judgment scenario. It's designed to recognize that in many situations, there's more than one correct answer. For example, the mean, this means that if an RP selects the top two answers, but has them in a different order, 
they will still do very well on the assessment. And again, we're going to provide you some, you know, some specific detail on that because we know this is something that's causing registrants angst out there. So we want to address that. Um, and so this this information about the situational judgment, if you can keep that uh, in your in your thoughts as we move through the presentation, I think the explanations we provide about the scoring will make more sense. Um, a little bit more background on the next slide around situational judgment assessment items, just so you have a chance to really dig a bit deeper. Um, why do we have five answer options? So uh, the kind of case that we're trying to develop is an effective way of creating scenarios that mimic real life practice as much as possible in an online assessment. There's often not a binary right wrong approach, as you well know, as practicing clinicians, but a range of approaches that would be appropriate based on the circumstances, who's receiving care, what modality, what their circumstances are. So for registrants completing the assessment, it better mimics the actual provision of care so that you're not expected to say, this is the way and the only way that that could happen. For the college, using a five answer option assessment model provides enough data to get a really comprehensive picture of, of knowledge and competence and gaps within 30 cases. If we didn't use the five answer option, from a statistics perspective, we would have to require responses to 40 or even 50 cases in order to really get a, a broad enough spread of information to be able to see where people's gaps are. So that's part of the reason that, that we're doing it this way. It really does make the assessment more robust. So moving on to, I think, my last slide, in this section, looking at the integration of quality assurance and professional development. As Madeline mentioned, the intent of the CBA is to provide registrants with meaningful assessment of their own competence as a way to inform relevant choices for ongoing professional development. Um, the, the approach here, just for anybody who's interested, is based on Donald Shun's reflective practice model, which works from the expectations that professionals can learn from their own actions and situations by engaging in reflection in action, meaning in the moment, or reflection on action. So looking back at, back at it afterwards. So the situational judgment case scenarios are meant to give you an opportunity to actually have that reflection happen as if you were performing in, in the therapy scenario in real time. So now I'm gonna pass this along to Monica to introduce herself and to walk you through the assessment. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Monica Zabalas-Keeben, and I am a senior coordinate, coordinator for QA assessments. Um, looking at the peer and practice review, or PPR process, like professional development activities, the PPR is a mandatory component of the QA program that supports registered psychotherapists in providing safe and effective care to their clients. The PPR is an assessment and coaching process that guides registrants on where to focus their professional development efforts. PPR activities include the following, case-based assessment or CBA, self-directed professional development and peer-assisted review activities and reassessment. The CBA is hosted on an external platform called FastTest. And for anyone who wants to have a look at the assessment process itself, we have a video tutorial that you can access to help you prepare. The link to that video is live in the presentation that will be made available, so you can easily access it, but you can also find a link to the video on our on the peer and practice review page of our website. With apologies on uh, for how small this, this might be on your screen, here's a look at the platform. Uh, just to underscore what Deb has already said, uh, the CBA is an open book assessment. This means that you are welcome to review any resources you choose to use uh, during the assessment. For example, you can consider having the professional practice standards available open on another tab in your browser or having a printed copy available. Each case outlines a situation and five response options. Registrants are asked to rank the five options from the most aligned to the standard to the least aligned with the standard. And once you have ranked the five response op options, you will type your answer sequence in the answer box. This type of ranking is typical of situational judgment scenarios, which are designed to recognize that in many situations, as Deb mentioned, there is more than one correct answer. For example, this means that if an RP selects the top two answers but has them in a different order, they will still do very well on the assessment. There are three possible outcomes with the CBA. 
Um, the first is no gaps in competence, which means that the registrant's professional development, or PD, remains entirely self-directed. Second is there are minimal gaps in competence, which means that a registrant's PD is self-directed, but the college will provide resources and ask the RP to focus some of their professional 40 hours of professional development um, or PD to address the standards where gaps were identified. At the end of their PD cycle, they will be asked to submit their learning record for review. Third is there are significant gaps in competence, which means that the registrant will receive support from the college from college staff prior to reassessment, or they will be required to engage in a peer assisted review with a peer coach that will result in a specific education or learning plan that will need to be completed before further reassessment. So where are RPs landing in these three assessment outcomes based on the current assessment offerings. In 2023, we had 1,724 registrants complete the CBA for the first time and eight registrants were reassessed, meaning that they completed the CBA twice. You can see from this table, the results were resoundingly reassuring with only 42 RPs or 3% of RPs showing con uh, concerning gaps in competence. And of the eight unsuccessful RPs who were reassessed, only one was unsuccessful. Here's the info again displayed as a graphic. As you can see, this shows that most candidates are in the successful category. This provides reassurance to the public and the college that most registrants are providing safe and effective care. For the profession, the CBA is a source of professional renewal and an opportunity to engage with the professional practice standards. So on to feedback to individual candidates. A few core concepts. Feedback is linked directly to the learning goal. So in this case, knowledge of the professional practice standards. It is intended to provide registrants with a clear sense of any standards where they have room to enhance their understanding. And the goal is for it to be useful to all registrants regardless of their outcome. Again, registrants whose first attempt at the CBA demonstrates no gaps still receive feedback about their assessment. We show people how they did relative to how all of the successful writers did as a group. Successful registrants are still encouraged to use the feedback to inform some of their professional development, even if it's just to read the standard or to review things such as their informed consent documents. Any supervision contracts they have or their electronic practice approach. Registrants who are, oh, I'll just wait for the next slide, sorry. Uh, registrants who are close to the pass score for anyone with statistics knowledge, this is anyone with one standard deviation of the successful average, will receive their CBA results along with recommendations and resources. They will continue to choose their own PD activities. However, at the end of their PD cycle, they will be asked to submit their learning record for review. We want these registrants to demonstrate how they address the gaps identified by the CBA and reflect on what changes they have made to their practice. It is entirely up to each individual to determine what's needed. Again, it could be as simple as reviewing the standards and checking elements of their practice to make sure no changes are needed, or it could be participating in a session offered by your association, watching a CRPO webinar on a relevant topic or seeking supervision related to the relevant standards. Um, here is an example of feedback that we provide to RPs who were not able to demonstrate the required level of knowledge and understanding of the standards. So what happens when an RP is not successful? I want to start by underscoring that this is not punitive. And just a reminder, out of 1,742, only 42 RPs had to redo the assessment last year. An RP who attempts the CBA and is not successful is not at risk of losing their registration. The first step is a meeting with staff to go over the assessment process and determine, did they 
experience any difficulties with the assessment platform? Um, had they had a chance to access support resources such as the practice cases that the college developed? Could it be helpful for staff to go through these resources? Once any issues are addressed, uh, the RP will be scheduled to redo the assessment at the next offering about six months later. And another reminder, of the RPs who were subject to reassessment last year, only one continued to be unable to demonstrate the needed competence and so was referred to peer coaching. Registrants who are referred to peer coaching will be assigned to a trained coach who will engage with them in the process of, process of identifying areas of strength in practice, as well as what would benefit from enhanced knowledge of the standards. All registrants identified for a peer assisted review must do the following. One, complete a pre-questionnaire. Two, submit examples of professional advertising and self-representation materials. Three, submit five clinical records and corresponding financial and clinical records checklists. And finally, collaborate to coordinate dates and times to participate in peer coaching sessions conducted by a peer coach. The goal of the coaching, which would typically be between four hours and eight hours, is for the RP and the coach to work together to develop an education plan that will address any of the gaps that they have noted, that have been noted. Um, the RP will have the next PD cycle of up to two years to complete their plan before they are scheduled to attempt the CBA again. Like all other components of the QA program, participation in peer coaching is one of your mandatory obligations as a registrant. Here we have a high level summary of the process steps for any registrant whose results of the CB on the CBA lead to peer coaching. You can see that it is a sequential approach with a focus on providing support and resources throughout the process, which, which brings us back um, full circle to one of the ideas presented at the outset today. The CBA serves to allow the college to direct resources to the registrants who are most in need of them in order to meet the standards of practice. Now I'm going to pass this back to Deborah to go through some registrant feedback and Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. So we have been asking everyone who completes the CBA to provide feedback after their experience. We use a survey. Uh, these are the top themes we've noted in the feedback thus far. So we've already addressed many of these issues to some extent, and we'll continue to take a quality improvement approach to the assessment and the other program elements to make improvements as we go, rather than waiting until the end of a particular cycle. I, I'm about to walk through some Q&A that came in um, through the SurveyMonkey signing up for this particular town hall. So thank you again for folks who did that. It really does help us make sure we're getting you the information you need. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide, uh, which speaks to many of these issues, as I noted. So uh, basic one, how many questions are there? Um, there are 30 cases with five answering options each, as we suggested. We recently increased the time to seven hours to reflect that the assessment is a learning opportunity. It's not an exam. You need to have the time that you need. This has really helped in limiting the number of people who've asked for the accommodation of extra time. The number of cases in the format have stayed the same. I want to be really clear about that. I know that some folks saw that seven hour time limit and had a bit of a panic, um, thinking that we had added more cases or made it more complicated. We have not. It is the QA committee's direction uh, after they reviewed the process and the feedback that determined that the seven hours was a more universal design approach. And as I said, reduce the number of people feeling the need to ask for extra time. We've interestingly looked at the results though, and have found that the time taken to complete the exam doesn't mean, uh, or doesn't have any obvious connection to success rates, meaning um, people who get through quickly are not uh, less or more likely to pass than people who took a longer time. So um, the time is available, people should feel free to use it. Moving on to the next uh, set of questions. I wanna be clear again, I know we keep sort of hammering at this, but it's not an exam. The, the results are not just a straight that pass fail and, and then you can't move forward and they don't affect a registrant's registration status or ability to practice. It's open book, meaning you can, and as Monica said, we strongly encourage that you do have the standards of practice in front of you, either on another web browser, which you're fully able to do, and any other resources that you need with you. It's intended to be a low risk, high result learning opportunity. 
Typically, registers need to complete the assessment in one sitting. So the platform launches the assessment and it stays open until you submit the answer to the last question question for the seven hours unless you've requested longer, um, but you can come and go as you please within that time frame. So taking breaks, answering calls from your children, getting coffee, whatever you need to do is not a problem. Next question is around when you get a, a, a selected and how that works. If you're registered before the end of the calendar year, December 31st, 2022, and you have not yet written the CBA in one of the assessment offerings that we've had thus far, you will be required to do so between now and the fall of 2027. We're giving people at least six months notice as to their CBA date, and there is a process to request a deferral if you can't write in the 10 days that the CBA is available in each of those sittings. So there are processes to make sure that you are able to communicate with staff about what will work and won't work for you. Next question is about accommodations. So just to lay the groundwork in terms of CRBO's commitment to being an inclusive regulator with accessible programming and expectations of, across all of our regulatory functions. So we can't exempt registrants from their responsibilities under the QA program. Remember that first slide, it is hard coded into the RHPA that people have to do QA. Individuals can, however, apply for any accommodation and accessibility requests that they need relative to content, or submission formats, as well as timelines. We're always gonna to strive to provide reasonable accommodations to allow registrants to equally participate in QA program activities. So the kinds of accommodations that we've provided so far include, as I've mentioned, additional time. This was mostly prior to that shift to seven hours um, and being able to complete the assessment over two days. Again, we've had a few people that have found that that's what they needed to do. For individuals who cannot complete the assessment um, because of an accommodation need, as suggested with this question, um, posed by one of our registrants. The option is to satisfy the element, this element of the QA program through a comprehensive practice assessment with a trained peer coach. So we go back to what we you know, sort of used to do in, in the previous iteration where somebody works one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And if that's something that's needed, it's certainly something that can be discussed and arranged. Um, it's a, you know, one of the possible accommodations for neurodiversity and, and for other reasons as well. So people are always welcome to ask for that kind of accommodation. Moving on to talk a little bit about the feedback, which as I said, has been one of the pieces that has been uh, you know, causing angst um, for our registrants. Um, so I wanted to address that directly. Let's be clear, it's not a knowledge test, right? The Dominion of Canada was created in 1867. That's a fact. The date doesn't change, you know it or you don't. It's not about competence, it's just a knowledge. It's a factoid that you have. An assessment of competence, that's how an RP would perform in any given situation. Um, looks into how people use their knowledge, their skills, and judgment in a particular situation. And it's not a binary of this is right, that's wrong, which is another reason, again, why we have the five answer options. So the way that the points are assigned is predicated on the expectation that RP sh should know what the best course of action is based on the standards and likely will know the, what's the least uh, aligned course of action with the standards. But there are possibilities in the mix in between. This also recognizes that practice setting, population, modality, these things all create nuances. And so the scoring has to allow for that flexibility. So anyone who correctly identifies the most and the least aligned responses will, as Monica said, do well. If we go to the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically. Hopefully this is helpful. It's getting quite technical, um, but I really do wanna cover this with folks. So for example, if the key sequence for a case is D, A, C, E, B, and the registrant codes their response, meaning D is the most aligned, B is the least aligned, and then they have A, C, E in the middle, this response would earn 20 points for that case and therefore 100% in that, in that case. If an answer sequence is misaligned, so say in this case that I'm talking about where it's D, A, C, E, B, I recognize this is a bit you know, sort of theoretical, but if you follow along, if it was supposed to be D, A, C, E, B, and you chose D, C, E, a, B, E, so you still put the most aligned answer in the first position, but you'd missed all of the other elements by one position in the sequence, you would still score 80% and therefore would be successful on this case. So basically average performance across all the cases as they are assigned to the various standards is used to calculate an overall total and report on the overall result. And that's what, that's what de um, defines somebody being successful that they have mastered the standards to the extent that they are able to, to get that 80% or so. Moving on to the next slide. This is another one that I really wanna make sure that we are um, kind of going over very carefully. 
um, and, and this, this is true for all practitioners, not just those with neurodivergence, the CBA is attended to, intended to assess risk. Nobody has lost their license because of an unsuccessful CBA result, and please be reassured, nobody will. The only way an RP's registration status would be affected by any element of the QA program would be if they actually refuse to participate. So a couple more clicks will get us to the next slide of registrant questions. But just to underscore as that got bigger. So this question came in um, really uh, in the last day or so. So we're, we're adding in as many of the questions as we receive. Uh, medical doctors and nurses are subject to practice audits. So they do have a risk assessment in their quality assurance program. So sorry, the question around following other professional bodies like doctors and nurses. And so again, going back to the QA regulation, which comes from the RHPA, those three pillars are required. And so they use practice audits. Their approach uh, in particular at the MDs, the CPSO, is more prescriptive than CRPOs in fact. Our goal is to allow registrants to pursue professional development that they want and need while requiring adequate engagement with the standards. Another factor in this uh, kind of scenario is that physician associations and education partners are part of a national group that doesn't exist in, in psychotherapy. It uses three bodies to accredit educational offerings. So there's an adequate range of professional development choices it's professional development choices for registrants of those colleges to, to engage in. I'd like to point out that those courses can be costly and they don't necessarily address practice standards. So psychotherapy as a profession doesn't have that capacity. And again, we don't want to be so prescriptive that we are telling you exactly what to do. If your CBA result is, is successful, you, you're free to choose, as Monica said, whatever PD is uh, appropriate and relevant to your practice. And with regards to the last part of that question about um, it being lengthy and overwhelming, I just want to note that 97% of registrants who've written it so far have been successful in the assessment. So I do appreciate the idea of the assessment being overwhelming, that the concept of having to do it might feel overwhelming. But I'd argue that the successful result would say that the vast majority, the vast majority of RPs know their stuff and, and aren't overwhelmed by the actual assessment once they get in there. So we, we appreciate that it feels lengthy with 30 cases, um, but I also want to note in terms of the, the notion that this is the minimal, minimum acceptable standard that registrants agree to practice to when they assume the protected title. Knowing the standards of practice is, is an expectation. So we've made every effort to make it an accessible learning opportunity. It's only required once every five years. It's available 24-7 for that 10-day window that it's open twice a year, and it is open book. So just as much as we can reassure you that the, the high stakes element is, is not part of this um, and that you should approach it as a learning opportunity. Next question around um, answering questions. Uh, this is a bit of a deep, deep dive and we do have a bit of time. So I'm actually gonna go into this, this one in some detail. So how would you go about answering a possible question that deals with client care, but is not directly related to a standard? So to be clear, um, all of the cases are created by RPs uh, with a view to creating scenarios that will allow you to exercise your knowledge of the standards. And so um, there won't be cases that are unhinged from the standards. They are there for that reason. But as I said, we do have some time, so I'm happy to do a bit of a deeper dive on this. So I'll just run through sort of the, the different elements of the standards that this question raises for us. So, and, and you will probably, um, I think, be reassured to realize that you know all of these things as I cover them. So when discussing drug use or abuse with a client, it's really important to understand your scope of practice and the requirements of your PLI insurance. What is it that you're able to do uh, based on the coverage? What is it that you're able to do based on your scope of practice with somebody who's under the influence? As you know, you're not authorized to recommend, prescribe, or dispense controlled substances, but you can certainly advise against consumption of substances that you believe to be contraindicated for your client. Clients under the influence of drugs are in an, an increased risk of harm due to their altered mental state. And so they, you know, you need extra care uh, based on their vulnerability if they show up for a session under the influence. CRPO doesn't have any requirement that an RP end a session if they find that their client has showed up under the, under the influence. However, you must determine whether the client has retained the ability to content to the treatment that you're going to offer that day as required by 3.2 standard on consent. An RP who's aware of a client's substance abuse may discuss boundaries with their clients in advance and so could anticipate this and be prepared. When dealing with issues of transference, 
RPs may wish to discuss the source of transference with the client and should seek either supervision or clinical consultation if they're unsure how to proceed. So that's the, the standards 4.1 and 4.2 around working under supervision. At all times, registrants must ensure they are appropriately employing safe and effective use of self and enforcing appropriate boundaries. RP should also carefully consider the impact of power dynamics within the therapeutic relationship, which may be magnified or altered if the client has experienced transference. As required under section, sorry, standard 1.8, undue influence and abuse, registrants must not unduly influence a client, their representatives, family, or partners, but um, in the making of decisions uh, related to care and, and, and other facets of life. And depending on the level of transference, an RP may decide it's in the client's best interest to provide a referral, in which case the stipulations entrenched in standard 1.9 referrals and standard 6.3 discontinuing services must be applied. So in both cases, it's important to remember that all practice standards continue to apply, even if the situation is not specifically discussed in the standard. So hopefully that gives you some insight into how the, um, you know, the standards are always at play and will always be at play in the CBA questions. Moving on, this is the last question that we're gonna answer before we offer some resources and open the floor. What's the best way to study? So as I said, the next couple of slides will have uh, resources. They are hot links so that you can, once you have the presentation, you can click on any of them. They're all on our website. The short answer on how to prepare is to engage with the standards, simply reading them if you haven't in some time. Uh, doing the practice cases, there are currently um, 10 online. We will be adding more before the next scenario, or sorry, the next assessment sitting, probably 10 more. So you have a total of 20 to practice with. Um, there are also case scenarios in the JRP module. You have access to that. It's a different way of looking at the standards. It's not ranking, but it does expose you to the standards and how they apply. Um, we'd suggest you attend one of your association's prep sessions. We know they're being offered. We're thrilled to see that. We think it's a great role for the associations to take on. Um, and I think that they're a very worthy endeavor in, in preparing for your CBA sitting. You might also want to just simply review your own practice as it relates to things like record keeping, informed consent documentation, electronic practice, all of those things that are online um, in the resource section provide guides and checklists so you can have a look at those things and make sure you are aligned with the standards. I should also note before we go that any time you spend on preparing for and the time you spend doing the assessment can be counted as professional development within those 40 hours. So you're in good shape on that front um, in terms of, of adding them in. So I just want to flash the resources um, slides on the screen. They are all there. Um, practice matters is updated regularly. We add subject matter um, based on inquiries we get, on complaints and reports reviews, and on questions that are posed to the practice advisory. Um, as Monica said, we have an instructional video. There's also a printable guide if you prefer to actually have something, you know, hard copy to have a look at. The standards are there, obviously, um, as is the JRP module, as I suggested, because I think that that's a really useful one. The quality assurance program regulation is there as well. I don't know how much help it will be, but certainly something to have a look at if you wanted to ground yourself in the starting point. And the next screen, the program policies, which lay out all of the different um, policies and procedures that guide how we're managing the assessment, how you can uh, request a deferral or accommodation or any of the other you know, sort of administrative needs that you might have relative to your writing of the assessment. There are the CBA practice questions, currently 10, soon to be 20. There's the practice advisory service. If you really get stuck on something, the PA is there. You can call and, and have a conversation with, with staff or with um, a practice advisor or have an email exchange so you have something documented. We have a number of professional practice uh, webinars. Right now, the two that I, I've highlighted are the standards webinar, just to go through the standards, highlight for you the updates, and then a recent webinar that we did on cross-border electronic practice. There's also an older one up there, How to Expect the Unexpected in Online Practice that was posted um, earlier during, the, during the, uh, the early days of the pandemic. Uh, and then finally, Peer Circles. We do have them uh, underway for another cycle. We will be launching them again. Very happy to be doing that in collaboration with our colleagues at the Ontario Association of Mental Health Professionals. They'll be offering those in the, in the coming months. So I think we can move on to questions. Um, if anybody has any. Amy, perhaps if you just want to um, flash the last slide with our, our email addresses up there, if people want to take note of that really quickly, um, those are the email addresses that you should use if you're wishing to be in touch with anybody in relation to the Quality Assurance Program. Staff are, are there to answer questions, so please use them. And with that, we can probably stop the screen share.
um, and take the last 10 minutes. If there are questions that are uh, unanswered, please use the raise hand and we'll try and get to as many as we can today. Can we just ask questions? Absolutely. If you can't use the raise hand, that's great. If people don't mind, you can call them out. Oh, okay. So my question is, what if um, I, I um, what if you miss the notification that you have been chosen to take the assessment? How many times do how many times do uh, do you guys uh, send it out? Um, I can speak to that. Um, so we notify registrants, as, as mentioned, six months in advance, and then we send a series of reminders um, and then post reminder, you know, we send further more reminders. <laughs> um, you know, we, we contact registrants in various ways uh, by email. We may leave a phone message or, uh, with a registrant as well. So, um, and ultimately if, if we haven't heard from a registrant, uh, by the time, you know, we're going to confirm uh, CBA registrations, for example, we will also contact registrants by uh, Canada Post and um, ultimately hope that we are able to connect with registrants to um, get them registered for the CBA. If we don't receive, if we aren't able to connect with registrants, we don't hear from them, registrant is unresponsive, uh, then they there is a risk of reg of a uh, administrative suspension at that point. But again, as mentioned, you would have received several emails by that point, uh, telephone messages and, and, and a Canada Post uh, letter. Thank you. One more thing to add, should that happen and you know you come back in, uh, we would also move you to the next administration of the CBA as well. Um, so you'd be registered to complete the CBA six months later. I think I see your hand, Margaret Nelson. Yes, thank you. So that happened to me last year for a number of reasons, I suppose, moving and illness and many things. So I'm concerned about getting the notice in good time. Um, when I mentioned it to the person I was speaking with, they said, oh, it does say here that you never opened that email. Uh, and I open all my emails. So I was, I am still concerned. I, I appreciate the answer and how many times and, and with this um, better understanding of what it's going to be about, I, I would probably not be as anxious if I was told a week before or, you know, something, oh, you're doing it next week. But um, I would like to know, you say six months in advance, could we have a date by which we need to be told so that if we don't, then we can mark it in our calendar and and get back to you and find out what, what your schedule is? Yes, uh, definitely. Typically, when we say six months, it's exactly that. So for example, for those selected for the 2025 spring CBA, they'll receive notifications the week of November 1st. And then for, and that, that would be the same for six months in advance for those selected for the 2025 fall CBA. And also, if ever in doubt, please email QA assessments at crpo.ca and we would gladly confirm whether you are selected in writing as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, and my, I, so my question is really about getting the actual date so I can carve it into my calendar. Um, and if, uh, you know, like, as I say, last year I was moving and many other things were happening. So it, it I guess, in the in the interim, I didn't see it, but I would like to. So right now, you said something helpful. If somebody was doing the fall, that's November first. Do you have a date for next? Um, is there a spring one at, that that we have a date for? Uh, yes. So if you, I, I'll mention the dates now, but um, for 
for uh, everybody listening. Our spring 2025 dates for to complete the CBA are between April 25th and May the 4th. And the fall of 2025 CBA will be October 4th to November 2nd. So you'll receive notification six months prior to April 25th and six months prior to uh, October 24th for the fall. Um, they're all those dates are also available on our website uh, oh, and the you. peer and practice review page. Thank you. I, I did not know that, but, but I appreciate the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, those are posted and, and they're updated. So I think I saw Irving had his hand up and then Paulette, I see yours too. So if Irving, you want to go first and then we can we can pass to Paulette. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a comment. I really appreciated Kenneth's comments. Um, I was grandfathered into the college as a marriage and family therapist. And my initial feeling was, oh, uh, CRPO really needs to protect me from damaging the public. And uh, I very, very much appreciate the kind and thoughtful process that you're moving forward. So great leadership. Really appreciate it. All the best. Thank you. Appreciate you saying that. Uh, I think we have time for Paulette's question, and then we can probably wrap up. Thank Paulette. you. Uh, I was wondering if we had the CBA in the 2023 cycle. What are the chances of having it, re having to redo in the 2025 uh, cycle? No, once every five years. So if you have okay. okay. finished, then you don't have to do it for another five years. So actually, once everybody's been through this, you'll know what your sitting is because it'll be five years forward from that. So it's just in the first five years while we're getting all the people who've always, already been registered into the pool. And then once it won't be random, it'll be you'll be on a five year cycle and provided that you don't need a deferral for any reason or you're not you know on inactive for any reason, your cycle will be sort of Pretty, pretty predictable because you'll just do it five years from when you did it the first time. Um, Justin, if you want to jump in real quick, we could probably answer one more question. And then I think we, in respect of everybody's time, need to wrap up. Sure. Thank you so much, Deborah. Really appreciate it. Not sure if it's appropriate to ask a question unrelated to the CBA. Would that be okay? I uh, prefer you don't just because we have oh, lots of our topics sure. coming up. Um, oh, okay. My, I apologize. Yeah, no worries. But if you want to email us afterwards, we're happy to cover things off with you, just so we don't confuse people who are signing into the, the recorded webinar later on. Okay, so with that, um, I just wanted to say thank you. I really do appreciate everybody's time. I know people are busy. Um, our goal today was to provide enough information that we um, have a group who know what questions to ask. If you still have questions outstanding, please do send them in. We are committed to responding. At the end of this, we're gonna be posting the recordings of each of the nine town halls, uh, along with the, the questions and the answers that came out of them. So there'll be a sort of a, you know, a record for people who weren't able to make it and also for yourself so you can refer back. And I don't know if you wanted to say a final thank you and then we can end the meeting. Do you mention my name, Deb? I'm, I was uh, distracted writing. Did uh, Yeah, I get distracted a, a lot. It, it comes with uh, age. In case you haven't noticed, I'm getting kind of old. Uh, <laughs> thank you for every... <laughs> Thanks everybody again for uh, attending and thanks for all your questions. I'm, I'm sure the questions that are in the chat that uh, weren't addressed will be uh, addressed by uh, staff, as Deb said. And uh, I'm I'm quite pleased at the numbers uh, uh, that were there today. Uh, I realize uh, that there was a lot of information uh, and uh, if uh, questions arise again afterwards and in thinking about uh, some of the stuff that we've been talking about, uh, feel free to uh, contact staff. You have the three email addresses that are specific to the uh, uh, to QA. And so, uh, great. Enjoy the, if you're around Toronto, enjoy the rain. Thank you.